Hello, it's Dr. Peg here at Elisha's home on Freedom Mountain. And uh, it's good to be back again with you this week to study the Word. Today we're going to be taking a look at Psalms 46. So if you want to turn there and prepare, in just a moment we'll go into a word of prayer and then we'll jump right into our study. Uh, I hope that you've had a wonderful week. Spring is on its way. You can hear some of the Canadian geese flying over. And uh, you can just see different signs. Hopefully in a couple weeks we'll see some flowers popping up possibly. Um, that might be a little soon here on the mountain. But if you live in southern PA, you'll definitely probably see um, some flowers popping up soon compared to here. So remember that we've been doing a series on... Uh, praying through the Psalms and today we're going to be taking a look at Psalms 46 we're going to be talking about God's power and his presence and his peace and we're going to see that the author um, he's not so happy let's just say that he's troubled his spirit is troubled and so today we're going to get to see how he walks through that and how he relies on the Lord even in a moment when he seems desperate. So let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and this time that we can come together uh, around your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your uh, encouragement uh, in times when we it seems that we are in the eye of the storm. We uh, thank you, Heavenly Father, that your presence is always there we thank you that you have your loving arms wrapped about us we thank you that even though we don't know what tomorrow will bring you know and you are preparing each and every one of those little details to benefit and to prosper each one of us and so now holy spirit you are welcome here and uh, we ask that you would have full reign we ask that our spiritual eyes would be open our spiritual ears would be open and that our spirits would be receptive to your word today in your precious name we pray amen so again we're studying Psalms 42 last week when we finished up we uh, took a moment before we closed and we reviewed the breakup of Psalms into the five different books and I just want to go through and review that quickly because we want to make some comments and reference to that. So in book one, we said that we saw Psalms 1 to 41, and that there were 41 Psalms in that first book. Book two starts with Psalms 42 to 72, and we see 31 Psalms in book two. And then in book three, Psalm 73 to 89, we see 17 Psalms. And then in book 4, Psalms 90 to 106, we see 17 psalms. And then in book 5, Psalms 107 to Psalms 150, we see 44 psalms. So, um, this particular psalm, Psalm 46, is the first psalm of book 2. And we're going to take a look at some general differences that we see in book two versus book one. So the Hebrew word in reference to God is emphasized differently in book one and book two. We see that in book one, Jehovah occurs 272 times. Elohim only occurs 15 times. But then in book two, we see Elohim occurs 164 times and Jehovah only 30 times. We also see that in book one of the Psalms, 37 of 41 are specifically authored by David. And then there's only four remaining that are not authored by David. And we notice in book one, David is the only known psalmist. Then in book two, we see that David authored 18 of the 31 psalms 
and that that would be more than half. So it just kind of gives you some facts about book one, book two, and helps you to delineate the differences. And we're going to begin now with Psalms 46, looking at verse 1 to 3. Now, before we jump in, we see that the psalmist is in uh, great need and he feels distance from God's house and he's discouraged. And we sense that there is despair in his spirit. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? So let's begin to look as the deer pants for the water brooks. Now I don't know about you all, but I've never been up close enough to a deer to be able to relate to this portion of scripture specifically. However, I can imagine, but I will say this, I have been close enough to a dog that's been out in the summer, running, 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 having a good time with their master, and then all of a sudden plops uh, to the ground and is panting for water. I can relate to that. So if you've never been close enough to a deer, to see a deer panting, how about a puppy dog? Stop and think about that. So we begin to ask ourselves, where did this thirst produce? Where did it come from? So oftentimes commentaries will say that, you know, maybe it came from the fact that there was a, a drought or maybe there was a heated pursuit. So either way, regardless of what caused it, in this scripture, it's using a beautiful visual to say that the deer was longing for and needed water the same way that the psalmist or we long for and need God. So this is an urgent need that his soul needs. He is yearning for the enjoyment of communion with God. And so I just ask you to take a moment and to ask yourself if there's ever been a season that you've gone through that you felt disconnected or you felt a distance between you and God and what was that like? Take a moment. You know, when we read the scriptures, we need to take time to visualize, but not only to visualize, but to take time to ponder and to be able to relate to what the author writes. If you can't relate, it's difficult to be able to consume something that you can walk away with and to actually apply. So we always want to make time to visualize, to ponder, and then to relate all right so when we think about um a drought i don't just think of thirst when i think about a drought i think of starvation starvation so in that we think of desperation when we think of a drought many times we think of the uh, infomercials of the children in Africa that not only need clean water but they need nutrition nutrition beyond just the water so there's a desperation a desperation so in this we notice that he says he is the living God and we know that He's the living God in at least three senses of the word. He alone has life in himself and of himself. He alone gives life and he is distinct from the dead and from the imagined gods 
of the heathen people of this era. So the scripture says, when shall I come and appear before God? So stop and think about the sons of Korah. They were connected to the tabernacle and the temple and their spiritual daily activities in the tabernacle. And we know that the tabernacle was an appointed place to appear before God. So we can see in this uh, psalmist that there is a longing to connect again with God and to be in fellowship with the people at the tabernacle or the temple. And then my tears have been food day and night. So oftentimes we look at tears and we interpret them in at least two different ways. Often we see that tears are a demonstration of grief. Um, that maybe the individual is looking and longing for relief in God. Second, we see that there could simply be grief over the perceived distance from God. Now notice I said the perceived because... God is everywhere, but sometimes we do go through seasons where even though he's right there, it's difficult to feel his presence and to embrace his presence. And so we can see that this need is intense and the scripture goes on while they continually say to me, where is your God? And so... Those that he's in company with are a discouragement to him. Instead of saying, okay, your God is here, and that the answer might come in the 11th hour, they imply that the answer is never going to come, and that God could care less, and that he's not present. Now, have we all felt that way in a storm or two or three? Maybe. If we're honest, yes, maybe. However, we know theologically that's not true, right? So sometimes when we go through storms, our physical, our emotional, and our spirit have a disconnect. There is a, a warring that goes on inside us as an individual. And sometimes our spirit is not what wins out but our emotions or sometimes our physical needs will win out over our spirit. And so in verse 4, we see that there's painful memories that bring further discouragement. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. So not only is this individual feeling disconnected from God, but also feeling disconnected from the fellowship of like-minded believers. And so this is a difficult this is a difficult thing, a difficult position. To find yourself in and you know I, I want you to stop and think often often you find that there might be a morning that it's time to get up to go to church and for whatever reason you succumb to your flesh and you don't come to the house of worship you stay in bed and then the next Sunday comes and for whatever reason your flesh wins over again and you do not come to the house of fellowship and as each week goes by it gets easier and easier and easier to submit to your flesh and to shove your spirit to the back and before you know it, 
you kind of lose touch with your spirit and your flesh is out in the front and your flesh is taking full throttle, full control and you begin to find yourself out of fellowship, out of sorts, discouraged and yet do you lay down the pride and do you come back into the fold where you know you were supposed to be? I don't know who this message is for, but let me just say this to you. That, you know, most all of us can think of a time where maybe we started to slip, 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 and maybe there was a slow fade. But there's something to be said about the individual that sits up and recognizes that, oh my goodness, I am slowly slip, 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 slip before they fall off the cliff. It's a little hard once you fall off the cliff to climb the cliff and then to get yourself to have enough strength to get yourself back to the fold where you were supposed to be. So let me just encourage you that if you're one of those people that you're just a snoozing away your Sunday mornings or you're snoozing away your Tuesday evening when you could be getting a message or your Wednesday evening when you could be getting a message or your Friday evening when you could be getting a message. If you're starving yourself of the word, then I call out to you and throw out a, a net, a safety net and say to you in the name of Jesus, get yourself back to the fold, get yourself to a safe place before you become so discouraged that you go over the cliff. It's a sad place to be. It's a sad place to be and I'll just say this. We've seen many go over the cliff and we've seen the no return and I'm not just saying about our church. I'm not saying just about our fellowship. I'm speaking this to the body. This is a warning. This is a warning. If you've been away from God, it's time to get back where you know that you need to be. Time is short. We're in the end times. Let's not take a chance. Get your life back on track before it's too late. Notice in this scripture, he says, I pour out my soul within me. When was the last time that you poured out your soul to the Lord? Notice he speaks and he says, with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. So when he's speaking of this, he's remembering the excitement the thrill of the communion with his fellow fellow believers as they celebrated the feast of Passover, of Pentecost, and of the tabernacles. Now, he's speaking to his own soul. He's speaking to his own soul. And in verse 5, he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. So he recognizes that he's discouraged, that he's um, depressed maybe. He recognizes that. And what is he going to do about it? So it's one thing to recognize that you're in that state. And it's it's another thing to say, yep, we, you know, we need to get back to church. I can't tell you how many times we've heard that. We need to get back to church. We'll be back this Sunday. Well, let me just say this. There's been a Sunday and another Sunday and another Sunday and another Sunday. And I didn't see you sitting in your seat. I didn't see you. But see, that's how it works. You miss one Sunday, you miss another Sunday, you miss another Sunday, and before you know it, it feels very familiar and comfortable. And that's exactly how Satan wants it to feel. Until one day, you are 
in such need for God that you've lost your way and you can't get back. You can't get back because you're now in his grips. So notice that in this particular uh, portion of scripture, um, he gives many reasons for his discouragement. There were many things that were bothering him. We see in verse 2 and verse 6, he's distant from his home and he's distant from the house of God. We also see in verse 3 and then in verse 10, we're going to see that there's taunting unbelievers. So then I say to you, who are you spending time with? Are you spending more time with unbelievers than you are with believers? And did you convince yourself that you're all about in a bag of chips and that you're the person that's going to go into the unbelievers and you're going to hang in that den and that you're going to bring them out of that den? Well, I got news for you. They just sucked you in. They just sucked you in and you were blinded and didn't even see it coming. Now, we notice in verse 4 where he speaks of memories of better days he also in verse 4 speaks of the present absence of past spiritual thrills so apparently he's going through a very dry period and then in verse 7 he speaks to the overwhelming trials of life and there are many that could identify with that hopefully we're in the end of a pandemic coming out of it hopefully but it has been a significant uh, time of trials for many, many families the last two and a half years. And then in verse 9, he expresses what he feels is God's slow response. So this is what he's saying. This is what he's saying. Listen to it. Those are not good enough reasons to be cast down when I think of the greatness of God and the help of his favor and his presence. Those are not good enough reasons to be cast down. So let me ask you this. This week, as you go through the week, what is, what is a good enough reason to be cast down? I don't think there's anything. I don't think there's anything. I'll just say this to you. There are many, many things that I know that you have gone through. Yet I can sit here and assure you that the greatness of God and the help of his favor and, pre and his presence far outweighs anything that you could go through. Anything that you could go through. Now notice in this scripture it says, Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. So even in his discouragement, he's speaking to himself. You know, oftentimes we talk about your self-talk. So let's just stop and ponder that for a moment. Are you a person that practices that? You know, when you go through something that's horrifically difficult, do you give yourself permission to be that big old depressed person and become a couch potato? Or are you that person that looks yourself square in the mirror and tells yourself to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and that it does not matter what you've been through, that your God is a greater God than anything that you could encounter on the face of the earth? Which person are you? Do you see the glass as half full or do you see the glass as half empty? And don't sit there and tell me, oh, that doesn't matter, because it does. Which one of those statements do you identify with? If you are the person that looks and says, you know what, the glass is half full, you will be the person that pulls yourself up by your bootstraps, and no matter what hits you, no matter what slams you, you know that you know that your God is a greater God than anything that you could go through. But if you are the person who looks at that glass and says that glass is half empty, you're going to be the person that's going to have to call the ambulance numerous times in your life because you're going to allow yourself, you're going to give yourself to have permission 
to have a woe is me party. Now I'm just giving you the straight scoop. Time to buck up. All right, so the help of his countenance. So the psalmist knew that he could look for help in God's countenance. He could look to God's approving face. He could look to God's extended hand. He could look to God's arms of love. He could look to God for whatever it was that he needed physically, emotionally, and spiritually. He knew that God was the entire package. How about you? Do you know that? Do you look to him when you're in the middle, when you're in the thick of the storm, when you're in the eye of the storm? Where do you look for help? Where do you look for encouragement? Do you look to yourself? Or do you look to God? So we know that the answers when we're in the thick of the storm and the eye of the storm, we know that the answers are not within ourself, but the answers are in our living God and that he is right there in the thick of the storm with us and that we need only to be patient and sometimes his perfect timing, he waits to the 11th hour and some of us in some of those moments, but why? But why? Let me just remind you that he is the administrator of the universe. So as the administrator, there are things that he knows that we don't know. So we have to put our trust in him. So an honest prayer brings the need to God, even when we're in a distant place. So in verse six, oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Milzar. And so it's almost as though he detaches himself as he evaluates his present spiritual condition. And so this can be a wise thing to be able to detach yourself, look at yourself and say, okay, if you were another person, this is what I would say to that other person. And then speak that to yourself and align yourself with the God that you serve. Stop trying to hide behind your problem. You know, if you can give the advice and you can give that message to someone else, then it would behoove you to give that message to yourself, right? So he says, therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan. And so this explains why he feels so distant. He is far north in Jerusalem in the heights of Hermon. So he's not close to the tabernacle or the temple. He's not close. And so he's feeling as though he's cut off. And yet we know that we're not cut off. We know that... It's a different uh, feeling to be far and not to be fellowshipping with those that we are used to fellowshipping with. So we see in verse 7 and 8, he lifts up a prayer from the depths of discouragement. Deep cause unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night his song shall be with me a prayer to the God of my life so oftentimes when we see a waterfall what do, what do you feel when you see a waterfall then they're just a when we talk about waves and billows you know have you ever sat on the beach and just watched the waves have you ever just thought about the power, the power in the waves as you sit there on the beach? That is a wonderful place to be and just to take time before God, time before God, dump, dump the burden and let him pick it up and carry it for you. So the psalmist here we know that in verse 7 and 8, he knows that he's, on, he's in deep trouble on the outside, but he also knows 
he's in deep trouble on the inside. And so these two depths are seeming to collide. And so then it sends him into a deeper mode yet. And so when he uses the waterfalls, the waves, and the billows, this is a form of imagery to present, to present. And so he says, I hear the constant noise of the waterfalls. It never stops. I fell from a previous height. Maybe he says, I plunged down quickly and was taken down deep. I feel buried under all of this. I feel like I'm drowning. But even in this, there are points of light that are giving hope. So he's crying out and he's saying, I am in the deep, but I know that you are there with me in the deep. So your depths call unto me in my depths. Your waterfalls are yours. And if I'm plunged under, then you are with me. The waves and the billows belong to you. And you have measured all of this. Doesn't it just amaze you when you sit on the beach? I know I've probably said this a thousand times, but, and it may be simplistic to you, but I'm going to say it again anyway. Doesn't it amaze you when you sit on the beach and the water comes up and it stops at a certain point, goes back out, comes back in, stops at a certain point, and goes back out. Like I said, maybe I'm just a simplistic person, but that always amazes me. How the water stops at a certain point, as though it knows just how far it's allowed to come. Just as the troubles that we experience only come so far. So notice he says, the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And so we see here the Hebrew, it's the covenant name of the Lord, Yahweh. And it is rarely used in book two of Psalms. But here it's used with a special strength, with a great confidence that God will command his loving kindness to be extended to the individual that is despairing. He says, His loving kindness in the daytime and in the night, His song shall be with me. So he came to a place of greater confidence. He was secure in God's goodness in the daytime and the nighttime. Yes, it can be more frightening in the nighttime, but God gives him a song that even sings in his spirit in the middle of the night. Let me ask you this. Have you ever woke up with a song in your spirit? And then you somehow fall back to sleep and then somehow you wake back up and that song is still going in your spirit. If that's never happened to you, I just want to encourage you to increase your time of worship. Sometimes we can get discouraged, depressed, and sometimes it's as simple as we need to spend more time worshiping God. So turn on the praise music and sing your heart out. Sing your heart out. You'd be amazed how healing that can be. Notice he says a prayer to the God of my life. This is another statement of confidence. And so the song from God is the prayer that he lifts. And so he continues to lift it, recognizing that the one true God is the God of his life. Now, in verse 9 and 10, we see a more honest telling of this psalmist's discouragement. Are you ready? 
I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go on mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me. Well, they say to me all day long, where is your God? So he has confidence that and refers to his God as the rock, his place of security, his place of stability, and his place of strength. Yet at the same time, he can be honest and say, hey God, it feels like you've forgotten me. And so we know that when we look at this, that we've got a battle going on between the spirit and the emotions. And so let me just say this to you. If you're going to bank on one or the other, you want to bank on your spirit, what you know that you know that you know. And if you've had a relationship with God in the past, you can bank on those things that he's done in the past, which will build your faith to believe for the things that he is yet to do today and the things that he is yet to do in your tomorrow. In verse 11, we see that it's a return to a confident challenge of himself and a focus upon God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him the help of my countenance and my God. So here he's saying to himself, why are you still so cast down? And we need to notice that oppression comes from the enemy and he will continue to bombard you. But as he bombards you, you will gain strength from the Lord from the time that you spent in worship, from the time that you've spent uh, studying the Rhema word, he will bombard you. He will bombard you and you may, you may feel discouraged. But when you look in that mirror, just as the psalmist did, what are you going to say to yourself? What do you know to be true? What do you know to be true? So in the past, God has a track record. When we get to the future, he's gonna, we're going to be able to look back to the now and we're going to see his track record again so remember we serve an unchanging God so if he got you out of the thick of it in the past and your heart is right with him he will get you out of the thick of whatever it is that you're in now and he will walk with you into your future so our hope rest in him and we see that this is repeated in verse 5. And we see it's repeated in the end of this Psalms also. We need to keep our hope in God and our confidence in God. And we need to continue praising the Lord even in the eye of the storm. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that regardless of what we're going through you were there with us and heavenly father we thank you for those gentle reminders that you give us of the things that we have been through and the things that there has been a positive outcome because of your hand of mercy and grace we thank you heavenly father that you continue to provide our daily bread. We thank you that you continue to forgive us as we forgive others. We thank you for watching over each one of us and walking us through the eye of the storm. Heavenly Father, we give you all honor, all glory, and all praise in the name of Jesus.
Amen. Have a wonderful week, and I'll see you back next week. Study, study, study. Take care.